Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our recalibration and repair webinar. My name is Nikki Chris. I'm a marketing manager here at Interface, and I'll be your hostess for today's webinar. Our presenter for today's topic is Elliot Spidal, Interface's technical services manager. So without anything further, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Elliot Spidal. Good morning. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you uh, all for attending. The um, goal today is just to kind of walk through uh, the reasons for uh, recalibrating your sensors as well as some common damage modes and repair services, um, as well as uh, hopefully address any questions. Um, so without any further ado, go ahead and get started. So essentially the question is why should we recalibrate our sensors? Um, well, the end goal is always to, to make sure you're getting the most accurate and reliable results for what you're doing. Um, so you want to make sure you have a, uh, you're using the, the correct data uh, from the load cell. Um, quality system compliance, a lot of uh, uh, quality systems will have a, a stipulation uh, requiring a, a regular calibration interval for transducers and other items, and a regular check on the health of your load cell. Um, you want to make sure that uh, that load cell is functioning as intended from the manufacturer, um, and a calibration is a, is a good, good check on that. Um, so why would a load cell output change from when delivered at the factory? Um, application loading conditions. Um, if there's something inherent in the application that is causing uh, the load cell to experience forces at or above the safe overload capacity of the cell, um, or a severe duty cell, or a severe duty application uh, where the load cell is being exercised uh, very extremely um, could cause a, a shift in output. Um, physical damage. Uh, let's say you had a connector get torn off or a, a cable that was, was broken and uh, a splice was made to repair it. Anything that could uh, change the uh, resistance of the bridge um, could impact that load cell output. Uh, environmental exposure, we do see uh, fairly frequently where um, it may be damaged uh, through moisture or other um, influence. And uh, some of our load cells do have an inert gas seal that can be compromised. And when that happens, we can see moisture ingress or other issues that would cause um, either a change in resistance um, or other issue. Um, and uh, over time, now this is a very minute one, I want to stress that, that there's not a whole lot of shift from this, but there is um, a, a very slight shift that occur uh, from a load cell over time as that, as that bridge ages and, uh, and changes very slightly. Uh, when should you recalibrate? What kind of a calibration interval? Uh, our standard inter our recommendation for recalibration interval is going to be one year. Um, however, this is entirely dependent on your specific requirements and the application that it's going in. Um, if it's an application where the load cell is often subject to potential overloads or, or something like that that uh, could cause that output to change, then you may want to use a shorter interval to keep a, a close eye on that load cell output. Um, if it's you know a, a, an application that's not being used as frequently or is very mild and mannered, um, you may be able to use a longer interval. Uh, the caveats here would be that, of course, you can uh, adjust that interval based on, on your confidence level in that calibration, but you should always keep a, a close eye and uh, analyze these calibration results to make sure that the correct interval is being used. Um, and, and again, uh, entirely subject to uh, your specific requirements. Um, and uh, interface. Why should you go to interface for your calibration requirements? Uh, we are an ISO 17025 accredited laboratory. Uh, we have nearly 50 years of calibration experience as a, as, as a company. Um, we've been uh, obviously manufacturing load cells, and the calibration of those load cells is a, is a core competency for us. Um, we perform nearly 95,000 plus calibrations performed annually on, on multiple hydraulic and, and deadweight test stands, so a lot of rigs to support your requirements. Uh, we can calibrate any manufacturer's load cell. Uh, we permanently archive our test data so we can retrieve and uh, generate history. Uh, we use interface NIST calibrated gold and platinum standard reference load cells for all of our calibrations that are obviously not dead weight. Um, and uh, we have a proprietary software package we use for data collection and analysis. Uh, we have no problem doing custom calibrations for what you need. Let's say you need some specific loading points or something like that. Uh, just let us know and we'll, we'll tailor that calibration for your requirement. And we do have a full service machine shop for uh, any mechanical requirements. That would be like a thread adapter or, or any, any tooling required to, to fixture the load cell in. And then, of course, we have a very dedicated, 
highly trained calibration and repair personnel. Um, the first priority is making sure that uh, uh, we perform these services for the customer uh, the best that we can. Um, some of the common damage modes we see. Any uh, connector or cable damage. Um, let's, this happens pretty frequently. Um, Any time that we replace one of these, we always recommend a recalibration uh, because it can impact the resistance of the, of the bridge. Uh, zero shift. We see this a lot as well. This is a very common symptom of, of an overload. Uh, there can be other things that, that uh, can cause a zero shift, but uh, that is very common. Uh, we can re-zero a load cell within reason, um, but past a certain point, uh, we can't repair it. Um, the resistances, what we do is we can compare different legs of the bridge, and uh, occasionally it'll reveal, uh, let's say it's been overloaded in compression, we can look at those resistances and make an educated guess about that. So it does provide a clue as to the mean, the means of the overload, and then what an overload is. It's a deformation of the load cell sensing element. Essentially, if you pass the point, the yield point of the load cell sensing element, resulting in a permanent deformation. Uh, you can see at the, the right-hand side of the screen there, we have an S-type load cell that uh, is clearly not parallel anymore, which would be kind of an example of, of that. And obviously, if it's overloaded enough, you'll turn a one-piece load cell into a two-piece load cell, and that would be bad. Water and moisture damage, that often manifests as low insulation resistance. This would also be seen as a drifting or noisy signal, so let's say you have your load cell and it's plugged into your instrumentation and you see the zero moving around or it's just not stable. Uh, that can be one common symptom. And then again, as previously mentioned, we do interface load cells that have an inner gas seal and that can be damaged, the ceiling can be lost, and uh, needs to be replaced. Uh, recalibration services. Uh, we offer a pretty broad winter range. Uh, this is a, kind of the brief overview. In more detail, um, we have uh, specific calibrations for specific types of load cells. For example, if you have a smaller, uh, what we call a mini load cell, uh, like an S-type or something like that, uh, we do offer uh, just a basic two-point calibration, just a zero and full scale. And then our interface standard cal is five points T and C. That would include an interface NIST traceable calibration certificate. Uh, this next step up from there, if you need what we would call an accredited calibration or uh, a calibration that would meet the requirements of ANSI Z540 or MIL standard 5662A, that would be standard 5.T and C, would include an ISO 17025 accredited calibration certificate and then ASTM E74 Class A. This is a uh, more involved calibration. This would be 10 points, three runs with a rotation in between each run. And it would include uh, curve fit, plots, coefficients, and a lower load limit on that calibration certificate. And then ISO 376 calibrations. We can offer class 0 0.5 to 500 pounds and class 1 for 500 pounds and above. We also do torque calibration here at Interface. Uh, we have the, uh, again, this is going to very closely mirror the, uh, the previous, but uh, again, standard calibration is going to be five points, T and C, and include a NIST traceable calibration certificate to, to, to 2,200 inch pounds, and an interface NMI traceable certificate above that up to 100K pound inch. And again, we would have the accredited option, NIST traceable to 2,200 inch-pounds, NMI traceable to uh, 100K, and next step up from there would be an ASTM E2428 Class A calibration. This would be similar to the E74 for a force transducer. So 10 points, three runs with rotation between each run, and calibration cert would include curve fit, plots, coefficients, and lower load limit. And additional services we have that we can offer. This would be like uh, customized options for you. We can do extra or special points, uh, additional bridges, system calibrations. This would be a combination of a load cell and an instrument, and it would be loaded in the rig together. Well, not together, but the load cell would be in the rig, and uh, we would uh, offer a calibration when combined with the instrument. And uh, we can do that, of course, for interface or non-interface instruments. And then uh, instrument calibrations, if you have a load cell simulator 
or an indicator that is a, would require an internal millivolt to volt calibration. Uh, we can perform those as well. Uh, junction boxes, this would be like for a multiple load cell system with a what would be called a summing box. And uh, TEDS programming for your load cells that have the, the TEDS self-ID chip. Uh, interface repair services, we can uh, repair your load cells well. And dependable 7 to 10 day turnaround, we try to turn those around as quickly as possible for you. Understand that your requirements are are demanding and need those load cells back quick. We do a complimentary evaluation of, of the load cell bridge upon receipt. And uh, any complete repair services for any of the interface load cells. Uh, this would include on a like a low profile or a 1200 series style load cell. This would include like a diaphragm replacement, connector and connector protector replacements or retrofit. We can add those connector protectors on some of the interface load cells. Uh, Re-zero, again this would be within within reason, uh, with, I should say within limits I guess. And then an inert gas purge and backfill for applicable models. Connector replacement for any manufacturer's load set. Um, you notice there's a little bit of an asterisk on that. Uh, that is subject to connector availability. There are some odd ducts out there that are a bit hard to find. And uh, if it is a welded load cell or if that connector is welded on and it's not an interface load cell, unfortunately uh, we wouldn't be able to do that for you. Uh, cable repairs, and uh, we can do TED's self-ID retrofits to, to other load cells as well. How do I get these recalibration services, or if I need a repair, who do I talk, who do I talk to? Um, essentially, the first step is you're going to make a request for an RMA, send us an email, give us a call, or uh, up on the website there is an RFQ form um, for an RMA. And to the contact, you can give me a call. My phone number is listed there. Extension 123. Lindsay Hansen's your other resource. She's at extension 152. And again, any questions, please don't hesitate to give us a call regarding, uh, regarding anything. Um, if you have a sensor you need recalibrated, uh, please give us a call. And then I think at this time, ready for any, any questions there may be? Let's go ahead and start with some questions. Elliot, I know you kind of already touched on TEDS a little bit, but Renee would like to know, how is the procedure for a system recal with TEDS? Um, so TEDS system recalibration. So that would be a combination of the load cell and instruments calibrated in the rig with TEDS. So essentially you'd have a, uh, a known output from the load cell and it would be programmed into the TEDS chip um, and then verified in the rig that uh, the instrument was indeed um, reading that output at that specific programmed um, calibration point. Okay. So we have a couple questions up here about re-zeroing and zero shift work. How it's performed, what we mean by it, and if it creates a new calibration curve. Okay, so good question. Um, so essentially a zero shift would be a movement of the load cell's zero balance. Um, so the zero balance of the load cell is the output in millivolts of the load cell with no load placed upon it. So you've got a load cell on a bench and how much output is coming out of it with no load. Um, so if a load cell has experienced an overload that has caused a, a slight deformation, so it's been loaded to a point and then uh, the material is yielded to a certain point, it's essentially going to permanently shift the zero output of the load cell. And what we would do is we would uh, essentially trim that zero back down to a, a closer or back to an absolute zero. Um, this would require a recalibration. Um, but uh, all that would move would be uh, the zero point back down. But again, as we're altering the resistance of the bridge, uh, we would always recommend um, recalibration be performed uh, with that service. Okay, this one's coming. Uh, asking if we compare our old CAL data versus new CAL data, and do we provide that back to the customer? So new versus old calibration data, um, standard, you're, if it, this kind of depends on the type of calibration performed. So if it's just a load cell calibration, you would receive uh, the calibration data of the load cell from this specific calibration that was performed. Um, upon request, we can certainly provide 
past calibration data in combination with that, uh, you just have to let us know ahead of time. Um, and of course, that's if we were the original entity that performed that uh, previous cal. Um, if it is a, a system calibration, a load cell combined with an amplifier or a load cell combined with an instrument of subtype, uh, you would receive an as-found and an as-final calibration certificate. The as-found would be the condition of the load cell and uh, amplifier or instrument as received. So we take that system combination, put it in the rig and calibrate it, and note exactly what its outputs were across that force range. The final calibration at that point would be the uh, post-adjustment. So if that amplifier required adjustment to be you know, let's say you wanted a, a plus or minus 10 over 50,000 pounds, if it needed adjustment to be closer to that plus or minus 10 at 50K, then the final would reflect that uh, adjusted calibration. Uh, Julian would like to know if we have the ability to calibrate torque transducers both with and without keyed shafts. Well, that's a great question, uh, Julian. And uh, we generally recommend that uh, customers remove the keys, if possible, from the shafts before returning the sensor for us to calibrate it. Um, that's going to be kind of a fixed ring specific question. So if uh, you have the specific model and uh, diameter of the shaft and then key dimensions, we can check on that for you. Uh, but again, our standard recommendation is to, to remove the keys before returning them. Jonathan is contemplating going over to TEDS. How does that affect his current load cells and their recalibration, I would assume? Okay, um, good question, Jonathan. Uh, so it's going to depend on the style of load cell you have. And essentially what we would do is we'd bring it back and uh, um, install that TEDS chip. Where it actually is in the load cell is going to, depend, going to depend on the specific load cell. If you're talking specifically about a 1200 series load cell, then uh, the TEDS chip would be installed uh, behind the connector on the load cell. Um, these would be on the fifth and sixth pins, most likely if it's a six-pin six connector. Uh, we would then provide a calibration certificate uh, and a TEDS content uh, sheet uh, referencing the calibration data that was stored in the TEDS chip. Uh, the other impact that you would want to consider is what instrumentation would be used with this load cell. You'd want to make sure that it is compatible with, with the TEDS, um, TEDS chip. Okay, this one might be a little bit tough and I might not have the data for it, but what percentage of load cells that come back for a recalibration are still in Cal? That's a good question. Um, so there's a couple ways of interpreting in Cal. Uh, that would be whether or not if it's still within your calibration interval, which would be the interval that would be uh, defined by your requirements. Um, obviously, we if you have a set calibration interval, we would recommend sending it back before the calibration interval expired so it would still you know, remain um, within your, your requirements. Um, as far as calibration specifications, uh, any load cell, if it's, an, if it's an interface load cell that returns us for calibration, if it does not meet performance specs, the customer is notified uh, of that uh, situation. Yeah, he had a follow-up question about being in spec, but you just answered that. So, Cristiano has a force transducer, works in a conservative elastic range of the material, right? The calibration process has a relation with the material behavior or just the sensor itself. Does that make sense? So, the force transducer works in a conservative elastic range of the material, correct? the calibration process has a relation with the material behavior or is it just a sense? So I guess he's asking how does the material of the load cell affect the calibration outside just the sensor itself? Uh, that's really I think more of a question of uh, that specific load cell's performance specifications. Um, manufacturer specs are going to be written to meet the specific properties of that transducer. Um, as far as uh, potential, so the load cell should be designed to work within a specific stress range of the material used. Um, I guess the only other real correlation would be uh, how easy it would be to overload the cell or cause a, a deformation in the cell, um, but that again would be related back to how the manufacturer spec that transducer uh, to start with. 
Okay, uh, Mark Bliss would like to know why customers would choose a five-point calibration versus a Z540 versus an E74. He still wonders what the difference between them all are. Good question, Mark. Thanks. So the standard calibration is just going to be uh, NIST to traceable cal. Um, if you need a, an accredited calibration, um, or your quality system dictated that you needed a Z540 or uh, the mil-spec uh, calibration for your documentation purposes, then you would want to go to the Z540. We do offer the five-point uh, standard as a, as a cost-saving offering to some customers that may not need that uh, accreditation level. Uh, the E74 calibration is a much more involved calibration that includes um, additional information uh, for depending on the way that the uh, customer is using their Cal data may be of benefit. Um, so ASTM E74 uh, it generally would be uh, someone that's uh, using either the curve fit or the, uh, the polynomials to uh, get additional, uh, let's say, performance or accuracy out of their Cal data. Uh, it also includes what we call the lower load limit, or what is, not what we call, what is called the lower load limit, uh, which is a, a point at which uh, ASTM dictates you can no longer take any calibration points um, below that specific point. This is a calibration that is often performed on load cells that are being used to calibrate either other load cells or that are being used to calibrate uh, other, other force machines. Okay, Cristiano is asking about dynamic applications and if there's a way to evaluate dynamic performance or is there a standard for that? And do we do any dynamic uh, calibration? Uh, well, our calibration is going to be kind of static by definition, so we're going to apply a known force. And uh, for best results, that's going to want to be as static as possible because you, if your load's fluctuating around, you're not going to get a good cal point. Um, so not really any dynamic uh, calibration that we would perform. Um, can interface generate frequency response curves through calibration services? Good question. Um, frequency response is going to be a function of the application, uh, not necessarily of the calibration uh, provided. Uh, there's a whole lot of variables that go into that, uh, how much mass is in the load string, how it's being applied. Uh, so really kind of a, an application specific question. We'd be glad to provide what information you can, um, but I think for that one, we'd probably want to take a deeper look at the application. So uh, maybe uh, feel free to shoot, shoot me an email, and uh, we'll uh, get that question addressed specifically. Could a high temperature application cause a problem with calibration? Good question. Uh, <clears throat> so any load cell is going to have a, it should have a temperature spec, um, and temperature can have an effect on a couple ways. It can affect the zero output of the load cell and it can affect the span of the load cell. Um, and the, how much and how is going to depend on how the calibration data is used, how your instrumentation is, is set up to actually instrument your test, and, and a, number, a number of other variables if, there, if there's a temperature gradient across your test. Uh, but the short answer to your, your question is going to be yes, uh, two separate effects, one on zero, one on span. Uh, it's going to be affected by the gradient, uh, across your test, if there is a gradient across your test, and how the uh, uh, the data is taken. So let's say you allow your temperature, if it is a high temperature application, let's say you allow the load cell to stabilize at that temperature, and this is of course assuming it's within the uh, the safe operating range of the sensor. Um, you, and essentially you're going to let the load cell stabilize at that temperature, and then uh, monitor the zero, and if your instrumentation allows, you can just zero that temperature shift out, or um, just note that as your new zero and, and go from there. And then the span output would be a little bit different than that, that you would have to apply any, uh, any span error specification uh, to your test results. Okay, I've got the last two questions that we're going to go through. So how does fatigue affect load cell calibration? If a load cell is operated past its fatigue life, um, then you may see essentially the materials start to yield, uh, which at some point would either manifest in a zero shift or a shifting output span. Okay, and the final one is another uh, question about temperatures. How much influence can cycling temperatures 
have on load cells output, and he's looking at ranges between negative 40 and 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, good question. Um, uh, I think uh, that's going to be really dependent on the type of sensor and the manner of temperature compensation, if any, that was performed. So that's going to be a transducer specific question. Uh, I'd be glad to address that more specifically. If uh, you could on that one, please shoot me an email and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the application. Okay, so that finishes up our recalibration and repair webinar. I want to thank everybody for attending and uh, have a great day.